Hey guys, quick announcement. A lot of you fiberglass RV owners have asked about getting ceramic nano shield coatings on your RVs. I'm happy to report that this is now available. So if you want to have your fiberglass RV protected by the industry's best ceramic glass coating, talk to Vinny or Brian, book an appointment, and yes, you can tell them I sent you. Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy. This is Long Long Honeymoon, and today we have a great topic for you beginners out there. Breaking your RV out of storage. Maybe you just bought your first RV in the wonderful year of 2020, and you've had your RV in storage, and you're bringing it back out into the wilderness. Now, we do not winterize our RV. Technically, we don't put it in storage because we use it year-round. However, in this video, we're going to walk through many of the steps you should take if you're bringing your RV out of storage. Tires. You knew we were going to talk about tires now, didn't you? <laughs> tires are actually very important. There's nothing worse than hitting the highway for a big RV trip and suffering a tire blowout. We have been there. We have done that. It can not only ruin your day, it could really ruin your entire RV trip because a tire blowout on a travel trailer, for example, can do a lot of damage to the travel trailer. You wanna check the overall condition of your tires. Most importantly is the tire pressure. You wanna make sure that the tire pressure is up to the appropriate specs. Now, we do have a tire pressure monitoring system on our trailer tires. It's called Tire Minder. I like this tire pressure monitoring system. I do not love it, but I am in like with it. It's easy to install and it has an alert that will alert you both to low tire pressure and high tire pressure. The tire monitor system also will check the temperature of your tires so you can see if one's running hot, which they will do on these hot summer days that are right around the corner. Now, you also want to check the condition of your tires for any bulges, especially if you have Goodyear marathons. <laughs> any kind of just unusual wear patterns. Something we actually noticed last year is that one of the tires on our Airstream was wearing strangely. And uh, I have a really high-tech tool that I carry. It also represents my net worth. It's a, a penny. This is old Honest Abe. Now, many of you out there should know the Honest Abe penny test that you can apply to tire tread, but you wanna stick Abe head first into some tire tread. If the tread does not touch the top of Abe's head, then it's time to change tires. Now something about RV tires, typically the tread can be in good condition because RVs are sitting still most of the time. It's not like they're driven every day. However, there is a shelf life to the rubber on these tires. Most people would say four to six years. You might get a little bit longer if you're running LT, light truck tires, on your RV, which we highly recommend. Shh. <laughs> you also want to tighten your nuts. Guys, how many times have I told you you need tight nuts? I'm talking about your lug nuts. It's good to have a torque wrench and to properly torque your lug nuts before you hit the road. For those of you with electric jacks on your RV, I'm sorry. My heart goes out to you. We've had a lot of trouble with electric jacks. No! So last year we actually had this fancy hydraulic jack installed on our Airstream by Ronnie Dennis Airstream Nuts and Bolts. You not only want to check and make sure your electric jack is working, but even if it is working, I would make sure that you have the tool that you're going to need to operate your electric jack manually in case you have to. Pretty much all these electric jacks come with a separate tool that you can use to raise and lower the tongue of your RV or your travel trailer if you need to do so, if, it, if the electric jack fails. And believe me, it will fail, and probably at the worst possible time. So while you're up here checking out your electric jack, it's a good time to look at all of your hitching apparatus, your weight stabilization bars, your anti-sway bars. Check their condition. Make sure you have all the necessary pins that you need to put everything together. For example, this is the friction sway control anti-sway bar we've been using for a long time. 
and I'm not really happy with the condition of this piece. So, I ordered a new friction sway control, and uh, we're gonna replace pretty much all of our hitching apparatus this year, hopefully, because a lot of it just is showing its age. We use the old school stuff, and in this special unboxing, I'm gonna pull this thing out. We'll compare the two. So you can purchase these, where else, but in the Long Long Honeymoon Amazon store. And, ah, oh, doesn't that look nice? A new anti-sway bar. Ooh, so nice. Yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Out with the old, in with the new. Now those of you with new RVs, don't have to worry about this sort of thing. But for us, this is an ongoing consideration. Ah, doesn't that look beautiful? I've never been quite so excited about an anti sway bar before. Something else you want to check is the condition of your emergency breakaway cable and switch. So you can actually pull these things out. But you want to make sure that this cable is uh, intact and in good condition because this is sort of like your last ditch defense if you were to have a trailer breakaway situation pulling this cable out should activate your trailer brakes assuming of course that you have working trailer brakes so next up on the list is to check all of your running lights your brake lights your turn signals your reverse lights all those things need to be checked out before you hit the road to make sure that others can see you well and to do that you're going to need to back up your tow vehicle of course and plug in your umbilical cable so we're going to do that and then i'm going to hop in the truck hit the brakes and the turn signals and sean's going to take a look and make sure that everything is working the way that it should so next up on your list is to open all of your windows, your doors, and your roof vents, just so you can make sure everything is working the way it should, that nothing is stuck. And there's nothing more frustrating than going to open a window and it being stuck and it's like pouring down rain or late at night and you have to go outside and pry it open. So we use our little bone tool and I've unlatched this from the inside, but I'm gonna go ahead and pry it open there. This won't hurt anything. Pop this into place. I'm gonna take just a microfiber wet cloth, just wet with water, and then you can wipe down these rubber seals where they've gotten dirt in the very bottom here. But you can wipe all the way around to get those nice and clean. And then once you have these clean, you can let them dry. And then you can take a nice silicone spray of some sort. You can either spray it on a little rag and apply it, or you might have something that just sprays directly. But that way it's gonna lubricate this rubber seal so that your windows don't get stuck again later in the season. You also wanna clean the inside of your windows at this point, because if you don't get all this grime off, it's just gonna get stuck again. So this is a good time to clean the inside of these windows, make them sparkle, and get them ready for some sunshine days. So next up, we're gonna open up our awning and make sure everything extends and retracts the way that it should. We wanna check the arms, make sure that they're lubricated the way they need to be. Just make sure that everything is working the way it should. And something to know is that these awning arms can corrode and become stuck over time. So it's important to periodically extend the awning whether or not you use it very often because if you don't extend the awning and it gets stuck you'll have to replace your awning arms ask us how we know <laughs> So this is a good time to wipe down some of these parts of your awning that you can't really get to when it's retracted against your rig. So right here, I'm gonna just sort of clean all this right here. It's kind of been gooped up between our RV and the awning arm right there. You can wipe down these on the inside. 
And then once you actually extend the arms, this is where you can go in and lubricate the arms so that they're good to go when you get out on the road. You don't have to worry about them being stuck. So we usually use Shield T9. They have a spray product, but they also have a product in a dropper bottle. And that's typically what we use for this job because you can be more precise about where you put it and you're not just spraying it everywhere willy nilly. Willy nilly. So this is the Shield T9 that comes in the dropper bottle. And this is really what we prefer to use for this just because you don't get it everywhere. You can be very precise about where it goes. So you can just sort of like drip it along here. And actually you can just you know, take your finger and get it all the way around so that it's getting all the little spots it needs to. You want to lubricate your shaft. Bow Shield is not only a lubricant, it also inhibits corrosion. It dries to a thin, waxy finish, and the protection lasts quite a long time. It was actually developed by the Boeing Corporation for Aircraft. Nice job. So if you winterized your RV, you did one of two things. You either used an air compressor to blow the water out of the lines, or you added RV antifreeze to all of your water inlets and ran it through your system so that you would have RV antifreeze and everything. If you added RV antifreeze, that means you have to flush it out before you can use your RV. So basically you're just gonna fill up your fresh water tank with clean water, and you're gonna come inside, you're gonna turn on your water pump, and you're going to open all your faucets and let the water run out. Now we did not winterize our RV, so I can't show you, but I'm just going to tell you. RV antifreeze is pink in color, so you can actually see it when it's coming through your faucets. So you basically turn on your faucets and let them run until they're clear. Now, if you're like me, you probably would want to do more than one freshwater tank of water pumping through the system. So again, it's a good time to be somewhere where you have access to a dump station because you're probably going to need to empty your gray and black tanks a couple of times during this process. So while you have all of your faucets turned on, trying to get that RV antifreeze out of your system, this is the time to go and check underneath all of your sinks for any sort of leak. So while the water is running, you just wanna grab a flashlight or a light of some sort, get down underneath and look for any sort of drip or water just pooling somewhere, just to make sure that everything is nice and tight the way it should be. Don't forget to check behind your toilet. That's a place where we've had a leak over the years that's just kind of slow and steady. And it's hard to see if you aren't really actively looking there. So something that I recommend is just grabbing a paper towel, folding it up and kind of stuffing it back behind your toilet. So that way, if it's just a tiny drip, you can pull that paper towel out. And if it's wet at all, you'll know that something back there isn't tightened the way it should be. You'll also want to connect up to your city water connection outside and run water through that as well, just to make sure you don't have any RV antifreeze there in that area. Also check under your rig for any sort of leaks for water. We've actually had a leak before coming out of our fresh water tank. So that's something you want to check before you get on the road because there's nothing worse than stopping for the night and realize that all your fresh water has leaked out while you were traveling down the highway. All right, so next up is checking all of your RV appliances to make sure that everything does the job it's supposed to. So we're gonna start off here with our cooktop. Basically, we wanna light all these burners and make sure that they are doing what they are meant to do. So that one's good. This one's good. And this one's good. Obviously, I need to clean my cooktop. That's on my list of things to do. 
So all those are in good working order. Next, we're gonna light the pilot light here in the oven. Don't be scared of your RV oven. It's a great resource to have. I use mine all the time. We're gonna turn the pilot light on and then we're gonna reach down here and we're going to click it and So the pilot light is lit. We want to give it a minute before we turn up the heat to make sure that it catches. So give yourself just a second. Drum roll, please. All right, here we go. We're going to turn it up. And we're going to see if it catches. I want to move your camera back so. Lean in if you want to Singe your eyebrows. This is exciting. This is why people are afraid. Rightfully so. So there it goes. So, working as it should. Also, do a quick reminder here. This is a good time to remember to get yourself an oven thermometer. This is invaluable when you are cooking in a propane oven. So one other thing to check is your hood fan. So you wanna make sure that that is working. This is on the low setting. This is on the high setting. Sounds good to me. Also, you want to step outside and check your vent to make sure it is opening when you turn on your exhaust fan. Make sure it's not stuck. Yeah, <laughs> make sure that no insects have built a nest there. You also want to check your outlet for your propane furnace to make sure that no bugs have built any nests there as well. I think that's usually a popular spot for wasps. All right, now is also a great time to check your air conditioner, your heat pump, and your furnace. Don't discount your furnace in summer because if you are traveling out west, if you're going to higher altitudes, you may be using that furnace a lot more than you plan for because sometimes at night it can drop down into the 30s when you're camping in August if you're at 7,000 feet elevation. So just check that before you leave home because otherwise you are gonna have a cold, cold night. Just wanna kick everything on this is our air conditioner we're gonna wait for that to kick in blowing nice and cold so we'll turn that off I'm gonna kick this back on and set it to heat pump crank up the temperature just kicked on. We're going to see if it gets warm. Several minutes later. Okay. And then last but not least, you have to check your furnace. So I'm going to kick that over into furnace mode. Wait to hear it. Whoosh. Aha. That telltale squeaking means it's working. So your other appliances to check quickly would be your microwave. Obviously, you're going to need a power source to do this. Our uh, solar system does power this, but for the most part, you're going to want to be hooked. For the most part, you're going to want to be hooked up to shore power or at least a generator. The next thing to check is your fridge and freezer. Now, we have not been disconnected from power, so our fridge and freezer are already cold and working properly. But if you've been in winter storage and you have not had access to power, then your fridge and freezer are probably hot because they haven't been turned on. So in this case, what you need to do is get yourself one of these handy dandy little thermometers. I keep one of these in both the fridge and the freezer. They're like five bucks, if that. It has a safe range for your fridge temperature and for your freezer temperature. 
You're going to want to put one of these in both your fridge and your freezer. Turn it on once you're connected to power or if you have connected your propane, you could run it off of propane as well. Set it to the temp setting that you want it to be at if you want it the coldest or, you know, we're kind of midway here. Turn it on and then walk away because it will take an RV fridge 12 hours to cool, possibly 24 hours. It really just depends. But I would probably give it a good two days before you really will know what it's cooling at. So check that thermometer after about two days. See what the temps are to make sure that it's at the temp it needs to be. So the next appliance to check that you will really miss if it's not working properly is your water heater. So ours can be powered off of propane or electricity. I'm going to fire up the propane and I just heard it light. So, you know, it probably takes it, what, 15, 20 minutes to heat up. So we'll let it do its thing. We'll come back, we'll check it, and then give it a couple hours to cool off. And then we would come back and check the electric. So again, having shore power or a generator nearby is gonna be helpful in checking all these appliances to make sure that they're working the way that they should. One other item to check while you're in your bathroom is your bathroom vent fan, exhaust fan. So our handle recently broke on ours, so that is something that is on our to-do list of things to fix. But I'm gonna go ahead and pop it up. We also need to remove the screen and clean it really well. But I'm gonna pop on that exhaust fan and you can hear it's going strong. So that's good news. So the only thing we've got to worry about is getting a tiny little screwdriver and removing this screen to clean it and replacing this handle here. Nothing major, but something that has to be fixed. That has failed inspection. Yes, failed inspection. So the last appliance to check would be your fantastic fans if you have them. Ours are just little push button. You can do them manually or you can do them using the automatic function. The first time you open these after they've been closed for several months, sometimes the automatic feature won't have enough muscle to push that open if it's kind of gotten stuck. So if that's the case, you can turn it off sometimes and then pull this into manual mode and then you can give it a little more you know, umph to get it open the way that it needs to be. One other thing to check are your lights. You kind of take them for granted, but when they are burnt out, it can be a total bummer. Uh, a few years ago, our shower light died, and so we were bathing in the dark, which, you know, it's a little odd. <laughs> it was comical. It was comical. So replacing that light bulb proved to be very difficult. It wasn't something that we could just pop in any old store to pick up. We had to like special order it. So when you're on the road, special ordering something like that, when you're kind of in the middle of nowhere and finding a place to have it delivered can just add stress and unpleasantness to your trip. So make sure that all of your lights are working properly and that way you won't be left in the dark. All right, so once your RV has been dewinterized, meaning you've removed all of the RV antifreeze from the systems, then you can think about sanitizing your freshwater tank. Uh, this is something that you can do anytime, and it's something that can be done before any trip if you just want the peace of mind, or just once a season or a couple times a season, it's really up to you. But it's really simple to do. You basically just need Household bleach, so just some good old Clorox concentrated bleach is what we use. And the ratio that you're gonna mix it is for every 15 gallons that your freshwater tank holds, you'll add a quarter cup of bleach. So our tank is 54 gallons of fresh water, and so we can add somewhere between three quarters of a cup and a cup of bleach. So what you're gonna do is get yourself a pitcher of some sort that you can mix the bleach in. So put your bleach in the pitcher, add some fresh water to it, stir it up a little bit, hang on to it, come out, fill your fresh tank about halfway full, 
Then you're gonna use your funnel and you're gonna add your bleach solution at this point. Then once that's in, you're gonna go ahead and fill your tank up the rest of the way with fresh water. And once it's full, close it up, go inside your RV, turn on your water pump, and then open all of your faucets. So kitchen sink, bathroom sink, shower, all that good stuff. Once you turn all of those faucets on, you're going to want to just stand there, let the water run, and smell for bleach. <laughs> and once you start to smell the bleach, then you'll know that it's coming through the faucets. You'll turn everything off, close it all off, turn off your water pump, and then just let everything sit for 24 hours a night. If you have outdoor showers or outdoor sinks, you can also turn those on to make sure that those are getting sanitized as well. Once it's sat overnight, come back the next day and just empty out your fresh water tank. You could drain it, but I don't like to do that. Personally, we want to turn on our water pump inside and just let the water flow all the way through. It's, it's helpful to be somewhere where there's a dump station because you will fill your gray water tank. So just be sure that you get everything flushed out. And once you do, add more fresh water to the fresh tank and flush it through again one more time. So you're gonna go through two full tanks of water, one that has the bleach solution in it and one that has totally clean water in it. So once you do that, everything should be out of your lines and you'll be good to go. We have here a remote control. I'm gonna show you a big no-no. What do we have inside? Batteries. A very wise man once told me, do not leave batteries in devices that are not being used. Because what do batteries do? They tend to corrode. And when they corrode inside a remote, it usually ends up ruining the remote or the device. So ideally, I think you should take your batteries out of your remote controls and then put fresh batteries in when you hit the road. So that's it guys, a look at a lot of different factors you need to consider when you're breaking your RV out and getting her back on the road. What about you? What have we missed? Chime in, post a comment, let us know what you feel is really important to check before you hit the road for a big RV trip. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up like it, share it with your friends, subscribe if you haven't, click the bell icon to make sure you get notified every time we post a new video. And until next time, what do we say? Lo, lo, ho, guys. Finally, for those of you guys who carry a dedicated banana slicer, this is my Hutzler 571 slicer. At the beginning of every season, I take it out, I inspect all the individual blades, you wanna check not only the cleanliness, but the condition of the blades. Make sure that they are in good working order. I advise you grab some bananas and maybe do a test run of a banana or two. We keep our countertops incredibly clean at all times. There've been no ants on this countertop. There've been no mice running around in here. Everything is clean enough to eat off of. So that's what I'm going to do right now with my Hustler 571 right off the Corian countertops. Now you can see this banana is not really ideal for testing. I would like to have a larger banana, but who wouldn't? But I'm satisfied with the size of my banana, don't get me wrong. So you want to press down your Hustler 571 evenly and now you know, don't try this if you're new to the Hustler, but you can dine directly off of the Hustler 571. So you can see, still sharp and it's ready to go. Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy, and this is take two of this entire video because yesterday we forgot to turn on Christy's microphone. We're gonna bleep that out. This is the most scandalous lug nut discussion I've ever heard. This is a family show, thank you very much. You'd like it to go in tight? There you go. You're walking on very thin ice, sir. You said you'd like it to go in tighter.